Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world in 30 answers. Discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I have the pleasure of sitting with Don Hagee of Vidone Vineyard out of Newburgh, Oregon. That's in the Willamette Valley. Um, Don, you've made quite a journey over to Oregon since you started in North Dakota, made your way through NASA and all the states around the U.S., and finally in Oregon. And I want to welcome you today and hope you can introduce Vidone Vineyards and tell us about yourself. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and have that opportunity. <laughs> So tell me, um, tell me about Vidone. Well, Vidone uh, is just a small uh, boutique winery on a little vineyard in Oregon that I uh, dreamed of of uh, creating back in the uh, probably eighteen in not I should say nineteen nineties. Uh, I bought the land in nineteen ninety nine, twenty acres, started clearing it. And planting the next year, and now we have about 15 acres of vines on 20 acres of land and a winery. Wonderful. And what are the grapes you're growing up there? Well, primarily Pinot Noir. That's what the Willamette is famous for and does best. But I have uh, some Chardonnay, two and a half acres, and uh, having an interest in other wines, I have Tempranillo and Syrah, small amounts. Uh, I do a couple hundred cases of each. Plus a little Viognier, which is necessary to make the kind of uh, Syrah I like. So I co-ferment Viognier with the Syrah. Okay, and what's your total case production? About 2,000 cases, although I might be cutting back a little uh, because of the difficult, oh, the competition, I should say. <laughs> Maybe I won't, but uh, uh, 2,000 cases is where I've been for a while. And um, what are the markets that you sell in? How is your wine available? Well, mostly it's directly from the tasting room, but increasingly it's necessary to go outside. So I have a couple of distributors because of the number of wineries that have uh, been created in Oregon. The competition is there. So I have distribution in Colorado and in Georgia, and then I do a lot of self-distributing in California. And tell me, um, what is your first memory relevant to wine? Oh, it's Robert Mondavi. When I was a student in Berkeley in the 50s, I used to go to Napa when there were, I think, a half a dozen wineries. And Robert and Peter were always there in the Krug family winery. And uh, that's when I became very interested in, in wine. And I was uh, fortunate to meet many of the old guys up in Napa in that era. So that's what hooked me on wine. That's what hooked you on wine. Can you recall um, the most memorable wine you ever drank and also what the occasion was? That's a difficult one. Perhaps it was a 1961 Chateau Latour. Uh, that was the wine of the century. The 61 vintage was the wine of the century, some people said. I lived in Washington, D.C. at the time or near there. And uh, California wines were not readily available, uh, but there were many, many good French wines. And the 61 Latour and also the, uh, the, the uh, Grand, Grand uh, what do you say, the premier, the Grand Cruz, the really great ones, were $72 a case. <laughs> 12 bottles of 61 Latour. Now, that was incredible. <laughs> And, you can't uh, do that anymore today. No, 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 you can't. <laughs> <laughs> and the Duzium grows for 35 bucks a case. Wow. Um, I think that was my memory of fantastic wines. But since then, of course, you know, your uh, tastes change and so on. So I, I like a lot of wines. I, I get terribly bored if I only had to drink, could drink Pinot Noir. But it's my favorite wine because that's what I grow. Uh, but I love all wines when they're made well. Absolutely. Made well is the yeah. important point. So tell me, traveling the world abroad, what would you say is the best foreign wine you've ever drunk in taking away that 1961? <laughs> well, perhaps some of the really great Rieslings in Germany. 
uh, were just incredible. I, I, I haven't had that, those for years, but uh, my father-in-law was a collector of great Rieslings. And he was a professor of medicine in Germany, and that's when I got to know the Auschleser and the, uh, I've forgotten the names now. <laughs> But, uh, they were the Baron Auschlesen, Auschlesen, yeah. Spotlesen. Trocken something. <laughs> Trocken Baron Auschlesen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're as much fun as they are to drink. Yeah. But I, you know, I love those wines. Uh, and um, among all the populations of the world, who do you think drinks the best in terms of quality? Well, I've not thought about that, but I, I, I would, I would think Italy and France both. When you're there, you know, going to the restaurants, you get very nice local wines that don't cost very much. And, and they're, they're almost always good. Mm-hmm. That's a general feeling I have. Yeah. <laughs> Do you collect a lot of wine and have you built up a cellar over the years? No, I did for a while, but I must say I don't have a great cellar now. I have some French wines, some Italian wines, but the, uh, no, after I got in the wine business, uh, financially, it's not easy, so most of those good wines have been consumed some time ago. But you know, we have a, we have a few cases of nice Italian wines from having been there last in the last two, three years, a couple of times. Do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety? No, I think that's very subjective. I think that's on the person. There are so many varieties in in the world, so uh, everybody has their own their own palate, their own taste. Uh, I like Pinot Noir, but I like, as I said, most varieties if they're made well. And what is your general opinion about wine critics and scores? I think uh, it's a necessary part of the marketing uh, system, but uh, the scores are kind of subjective and we don't, I don't like them, but (laughs) I understand the need for them. Uh, because I've I've submitted wines to different major publications, getting scores ranging from 88 to 92, the same wine. And so what does that tell you? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it depends on the day and your mood and the food and lots of things. Uh, but it's part of the, I call it a game, yeah. and you have to play it. Yes. So you make up a good point that so much is about your mood. But let's talk about you as a wine drinker, and let's think in a general sense. Red, white, or rosé? Red, preferentially, then white, and rosé on a hot summer day, but I'm not a huge rosé fan, but I I like it with certain foods in the summer, but I drink more reds, although in the winter I tend tend to drink more, a little bit more white. In the winter? Yeah. We eat a lot of seafood, and so we do like good whites with the seafood. All the Pinot Noir goes quite well with salmon mm-hmm. and seafood too. Yeah. What about uh, still wine or sparkling wine? I love a good sparkling when it's when it's good. It's got to be really good. <laughs> <laughs> and not expen- if it isn't expensive, I don't care for it. Um, how do you approach food and wine pairing? Do you feel that there are some hard and fast rules that, that should be followed or do you play with it? And if so, how do you approach it? No, I don't think they're hard and fast rules. It's what you like. Uh, but, you know, there are certain pretty obvious things. You want to have a big, heavy wine with a light food. It doesn't work. It over-dominates it. But it's up to the individual as to what you like. And uh, as long as they're kind of in balance, so to speak, with uh, maybe sugars or acidity and so on, uh, whatever you like. But, uh, no, I don't have any hard and fast rules. I'm not a good... Uh, a good one for wine pairing. Vicky is my wife. <laughs> so we'd have to ask her the rules. That's true. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of times a winemaker, I know we were talking earlier and you said that when you're making wine, you're not trying to impose anything on a wine. You want the grapes to speak for themselves. Yes. If someone were to taste your wine for the very first time, what would you want them to experience? What are they losing out on if they don't taste your wine? Well, it, uh, maybe it's doesn't mean too much, but it should be in balance. When I think about it, is 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 the acid too too much, uh, or is it, is it too sweet, or is, is, is the uh, structure is it too big and doesn't uh, doesn't have the uh, 
the uh, acid to support it. Uh, for example, if you take a, a wine, I, I've had some wines that have uh, 16% alcohol, but they're so well balanced that you don't even know it. I've had some wines that were 15% percent and more and that's unusual in Oregon I try not to do that but uh, the balance was so great that when I ask people what's the alcohol they say oh, maybe 13 14 can't tell so it's about balance mm -hmm. uh, the various components of, of the wine uh, as you describe it and that's all very subjective too right. but the acidity the sweetness the structure the the aromatics just got to be in balance so if someone tastes your tastes your wine for the first time the hope is that they find balance That's right. Yeah, that if they come out and, and say, uh, you know, this is this is sour, well, they probably don't know wine, but that's not a good sign. <laughs> so, if space aliens were to land on your property, what is the wine that you'd want to present them with? Well, Pinot Noir from the old block that I planted in 2000. It's, I think that's that's the best wine. Uh, All the Chardonnays are younger, but doing well. But uh, no, it's a Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. That's what Oregon is about. Oh. And uh, you know, I think we do relatively well when compared to a lot of the French wines in the same price range. Mm -hmm. And California has a, a very good Pinot. It's different, slightly, slightly different styles because of the climate and so on and the soil. But, but um, Oregon does quite well. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of Oregon and knowing uh, the climate there is very unique, do you feel that uh, from vintage to vintage you see more variation or do you see more similarities? Oh, we see variations. Every year is a bit different. Mm -hmm. And so you make a, make a different wine. Um, and that's partly, maybe it's global warming. I don't know. It's getting warmer. Mm -hmm. But we've had some very wet years early on and uh, and some years when it was very dry and late uh, like uh, I think it was 2011 we harvested at the end of October and some were harvesting in November whereas uh, in some years well last year for example we harvested the Syrah on September 23rd in 2018 but in 2017 we harvested the same block on October 10th. Wow. That's over two weeks, three weeks. Why? Uh, climate, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. So okay. vintage variation. Now, are there any signs that you look for that are going to tell you the outcome of a harvest? Any omens or signs? Well, we always watch the stress, the levels on the vines, and I don't use irrigation anymore. I have it. Um, uh, but uh, We watched the, I guess we watch for the, the stress, the leaves, and we don't have to, we don't worry about uh, any insects or pestis, uh, pests at all, except pottery mildew is the only thing we really worry about and keep on top of. Uh, otherwise, we just look at the stress levels and check the sugars they develop and make a decision as to when the flavor, it's, it's about flavor. Mm -hmm. and bring them in when we think it's right uh, and uh, there's not much more to, to do to do it the vines if the, if the vines are really starting to uh, get stressed heavily they're going to ripen a lot sooner and um, so we'll probably harvest earlier but I, don't, I still don't turn the water on mm -hmm. and do you have any rituals to that you do at the beginning of harvest or throughout harvest no we don't have any rituals uh No opening up the sparkling wine, no uh, well, killing the first yeah, uh, rodent you my, find. I don't, but my new my winemaker did. Yeah, we when the first harvest, he, he used his uh, his sword to break open the top of a champagne bottle ah, this year. There's a tradition, <laughs> a new one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's more creative than I am, my new winemaker. And your new winemaker joined in what year? In 17. He's been there two, it'll be two years in May. Uh, so you're shifting from winemaker to just winery owner here. Just, that's right, and selling it the hard part. Ah, taking the hard job. The fun job's the making the wine. That's easy. That, <laughs> yeah, that's true. So in all the years that you were making wine, and, and still these are your babies, this is your estate fruit, um, have you been known to walk through your vineyards and talk to the grapes, or do you talk to the wine when it's in the barrel? And if so, what do you say to it? 
Well, I'm not sure I talk, but I certainly walk in the vineyard a lot, and I, I probably talk not necessarily to the grapes, but I talk to myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, I do maybe talk when I'm tasting some of the really good barrels and picking a favorite barrel. Kind of pat I, it on the back. And <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure I say things then when there's no one around. <laughs> So you won't tell us what you're saying because it's a secret. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember that. <laughs> so when you were a little kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, that's a good question, a tough one, because I grew up in an area and a time when I didn't know what an education was or universities were. And I probably was going to be a farmer at, when I was young. Well, on that note, um, would you share with our listeners what a fascinating career you had? Because you didn't turn out to be a farmer. You you are now a farmer. You ended up a farmer. But what did you do in between? Well, after the military, I flew in Korea. I uh, went to, to Cal, University of California, to finish my engineering degree and got intrigued by physics. A fellow named Ernest Lawrence, Lawrence Lab, got me excited. So I changed the physics and did my PhD on uh, accelerators and particle physics. And then I did a postgrad in France, and that's when I discovered Burgundy <laughs> and came back and uh, left the physics world to go to NASA uh, as a candidate for the astronaut program. But I did get into that program, but I stayed on and did experiments on satellites, and then I became chief of the physics branch at Houston for the Apollo program, and was there from the beginning through Apollo 13. And then uh, I went back to Silicon Valley in California and got into high-tech business. <laughs> so you witnessed the first time man walked on moon? I was in Houston, watching carefully, wow. much of the time in the control room. <laughs> And through Apollo 13, that's a pretty amazing career, followed by Silicon Valley. And now, what, a third career? Back to farming, which is what you thought you'd be when you were a kid. Yeah, back to where I started. I like farming. <laughs> I like tractors and <laughs> airplanes and machinery. <laughs> so it all comes full circle. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's true. And so when you're not working, how do you spend your free time these days? Well, you know, I'm starting to, uh, I, I guess I read a lot now. But until recently, I haven't had much free time. There's no, there's no Sunday weekends or anything like that. I was, I was working. Yeah. But uh, I, I used to ski a lot, and I stopped. And I used to bike a lot, and I stopped because at my age, I don't want to break any bones. No, no, probably better. You want to keep making wine. Yeah. But I, I used to be a serious biker, and uh, and skier. But now I'm just reading and exercising. And um, and then I know that uh, you said your wife is involved in the business with you. I mean, she likes to organize the events at the winery and things like that. When you're planning a romantic evening, what are the wines that you would order or select to drink? Probably a Burgundy. Mm -hmm. That's what she likes best. So a good Burgundy that's not a, an Oregon Pinot Noir, you know, a, a, a <laughs> French Burgundy. Just to mix things up a little bit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> What is the best piece of advice you ever received? Ooh. Um, Although I know that's a tough question. For a man of your stature who has lived so many decades, I'm sure you've received a lot of great advice. Well, to, uh, Louis Alvarez, a Nobel laureate in physics I worked with a lot, used to say things to me, and I can't use ex his exact words, but <laughs> basically what he was saying never give up keep your positive attitude no matter what happens always think about you know the full glass mm -hmm. and never think about the other and that's uh, I've always done that I'm happy every day so uh, I can't complain about anything if I have a problem it's of my making I have to go do something about it very good advice that you received it's a good way to look at life I agree. And if you could share a piece of advice to our listeners today, what would you like to tell them? Find out what you really like to do and what turns you on and makes you excited. I may not make you the most money, but money isn't what it's about. It's about uh, the satisfaction of living every day, the, the, the happiness 
and meeting new challenges and, uh, and uh, uh, do, do what turns you on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have too many friends who are not very happy and they're very wealthy. They've done the wrong things. Mm -hmm. uh, so find out what you like and do it. And you can do anything you want, almost. Just set your sights high. you got to work hard at it. But you can do it. So you've had a long storied career. And I mean, considering that you witnessed man first walking on moon and have lived through, you know, as you said, to the 13th Apollo, and now you have a winery and everything. What would you say is your proudest achievement in your work to date? <laughs> well, going back to when I left NASA, it was the first company I founded. Because we revolutionized the way you did a data analysis in chemical laboratories. And I was way out on a limb and, and uh, I did it right. And now I've been copied by a lot of people. Ah. And uh, that was a real significant accomplishment. Because I did it with no money almost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had been on food stamps and unemployment and I founded a company and I made it happen. Wow. And That's an achievement. And you can't do that now. It's not the same. No. And uh, tell me something. Let's complete the sentence. A table without wine is like? A day without sunlight. It's true. Now, a VIP is sitting at a table in a restaurant. I want you to use your imagination. The paparazzi shoot this VIP sitting at the table and caught in the background of that photo is a bottle of your wine sitting on the table. Who would you want that person to be? Well, using the round now, it would be JFK. Because mm. he loved wine. <laughs> ah. And I, met, I saw him a couple of times. Did you? Never drank wine I with him? I never shook hands with him, though, but I saw him. I was <laughs> close to him. Wow. Amazing. I want to learn more about that. <laughs> Do you think that we'll still be drinking wine in 200 years' time or beyond? I think we'll be drinking wine as long as we consume food. I, mean, it's just, I think it's just a part of the food chain. Mm -hmm. Even with climate change and everything else, you think we'll, wine will survive? Wine will change, but food will change too. That's true. Very true. Name three wines you would want to take with you to a deserted island. A good Sauvignon Blanc. And a Pinot Noir, I wouldn't put a label on them, but those are two. And um, probably a good sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a good champagne. It's a nice trio. Yeah, I think so. And should you have some free time to travel, is there one area in the world, one winemaking region in the world that is on the top of your bucket list to explore? I'd like to go to Croatia. Mm. Not been there. Because a lot of, I think the original winemaking was came from that area, that region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So before we finish, we always play a little game here at Wine Soundtrack, um, correlating wine and music. Um, you know, a lot of times as we drink wine, we like to listen to music or it makes us think of something or puts us in a mood. So I just want to know, you know, off the top of the cuff, Mentioning some of the wines you were talking about, what you either would want to be listening to or what, what it makes you think of. So let's start with um, an Auschwitz and Riesling. Well, that would be uh, maybe um, a, a good uh, classical music, uh, Viennese. Uh, yeah. Wall scissors, something like that. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay. And what about your Chardonnay? Oh, something more light. Uh, jazz. I love jazz. And um, take five. Take five. Mm -hmm. And then we're sitting here. We have glasses in our hand. If you can just tell everyone what we're drinking right now and what kind of music you're thinking of as we swirl this beautiful Pinot Noir uh, as we take a sip of it too to remember uh, and can you just uh, let everyone know what is this wine this one here is the uh, Barrel Select mm -hmm. 
uh, a pick of your favorite grapes. Yeah, my favorite barrels. Yeah, I, I oh, I would think going about um, probably jazz because I'm a big jazz fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, something kind of mellow, not wild, but, or maybe maybe a John Coltrane. Ooh, I can see that. Yeah. Got that kind of cool, mellow, yeah, yeah, right. little tart cherry laid back. Yeah, laid yeah. back. Huh. Yeah, yeah. It's a perfect pairing. Yeah. Well, Don, I want to thank you for joining us here today at Wine Soundtrack. And before we go, if you can just remind everyone where they can find your wines and if they can visit you. I'd love to have you visit uh, the winery near Newburgh. Easy to find, bidonvineyard.com. And I'm Don, but you can go to info at bidonvineyard.com or call... Uh, the wines are not in many places in California yet. The only one so far is Chinois. <laughs> <laughs> in L.A., in the Bay Area, there are several places that have them, Drager's Markets and so on. But the best place is to go online and order them. And around the country, people can order it. Yes, that's right. You can order it online. I ship uh, sort of a third of my wines out directly that's to awesome. people online. And also, I, I meant to ask this earlier, but just to um, Vidon, where does that name come from? Well, that's another story. It's it's a French name, uh, but it comes from Vicky and Dawn, and she picked the name. She offered Don V to be very nice, but that doesn't <laughs> fit. Uh, I've had emails in French asking if we are related, but it turns out about... Uh, well, when I tried to get Vidon.com in 2000, I discovered it was owned by a law firm in France. Um, so we have Vidon Vineyard. But uh, later on, uh, this person, Patrice Vidon, wrote to me eight or ten years ago, uh, asked about, the, you knew about the wine, asked about it. We had a nice exchange online. I shipped him wine as a gift. And he invited us to his chateau. He said, we have plenty of room in our chateau. It was built in 1680. We accepted and spent a beautiful week in Breton in Brittany wow. with uh, Patrice uh, six years ago. Wow. So who knew that taking you and your wife's names would lead to living in a chateau? <laughs> that, was, that was great. Well, again, Don, thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope that uh, we'll see more of it on Vineyards and definitely have to visit you when we're next up in the Willamette Valley. I hope you will. And I hope uh, to see you more down here or there because I hope to be back. I'd love to have more wine in Southern California. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. <laughs> Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.